Suge Knight was a 315-pound behemoth. Known for his towering presence, menacing aura, and hardcore brutality, he was the ultimate personification of the 1990s gangster. His antics, as well as his personality, have punctuated a lot of hip-hop tracks for over three decades. But how many of these references to him actually took place? Here are Suge Knight lyrics that really happened. Suge by Baby. In the debut album titled Baby on Baby by Charlotte Rapper DaBaby, the second track Suge has DaBaby render a homage to Marion Suge Knight, the co-founder and former head of Death Row Records. At the end of the chorus, he drops the following lyrics. I'm a young CEO, Suge, yeah, yeah, yeah. The song deals with several topics, which reflect the life that Suge Knight lived in the 90s and early 2000s, including his riches, selling drugs, signing record deals, and threatening opposition. But before he got to actually do all these, let's talk about his rise from the bottom to the pinnacle of gangster rap. Born in Compton, California, as the only son of a truck driver and homemaker in the impoverished and predominantly black section of urban South Central Los Angeles. As a child, Marion Knight was nicknamed Suge by his mother due to his apparently sweet demeanor. He once remarked to his parents that, one day, I'm going to live in a house with a second story and have lots of cars. And just a few years later, he would achieve all these. As an 18-year-old, he would have a very brief American football career. Shoot went undrafted in the 1987 NFL draft, but was invited to the Los Angeles Rams training camp. He was cut by the Rams during camp, but became a replacement player during the 1987 NFL player strike and played just two games for the Rams. After his short stint as an American footballer, Suge found work as a concert promoter and a bodyguard for celebrities such as Bobby Brown. Finally, in 1989, Suge entered the music business full-time and formed his own music publishing company. His first big profit in the music business came when Vanilla Ice agreed to sign over royalties from his smash hit Ice Ice Baby because the song included material allegedly written by Knight's client Mario Johnson. Knight and his bodyguards confronted and threatened Vanilla Ice several times. This was a theme that punctuated his professional relationship with those who worked under him. Suge was a huge guy, prone to cigars and always walking, around with a dangerous aura and a real sense of swagger and intimidation. And very quickly, stories about what Suge would resort to to get the contracts and the deals of the agreements the way that he wanted became legendary. There were tales of him utilizing the tank of piranhas that he kept in his office Office, and of him having people dangled by their ankles off of the balcony of a hotel many floors up. His exploits, some mythic, some real, during the heyday of Death Row Records, have become part of hip-hop lore. In his memoir, former NWA manager Jerry Heller allegedly mentioned that Knight and his cohorts, bearing baseball bats, intimidated Easy e into releasing Dre from his Ruthless Records contract. In 1996, Suge Knight was sitting next to Tupac when he was gunned down in Las Vegas. His participation in a fight on the night of the shooting would also land him in prison for five years on a probation violation. More on these stories later. Suge next formed an artist management company and signed West Coast hip-hop artist DJ Quick and the Doc. Through the latter, he met several members of the gangster rap group NWA. This is where his ascent to the very top would begin. At about this time, the NWA group was already riddled with a lot of friction between the members, especially between Ice Cube and Easy e with the manager Jerry Heller. You see, just two years after forming the group, Ice Cube decided to part ways in December 1989. He decided to leave due to his being discontented with the movement of cash flow within the group. Ice Cube wanted the extra royalties deservedly. He felt he deserved it because, for all intents and purposes, he had written most of the group's landmark album, Straight Outta Compton, as well as a major portion of Easy es 1988 solo album Easy Does It, and he took his grievance to Jerry Heller, the group's manager. It took some time for the other members to realize money wasn't going into their pockets properly, but once they did, they also departed as well, the most notable being that of Dr. Dre and fellow Ruthless Record MC DOC. As the cutthroat businessman that he is, Suge Knight eventually succeeded in procuring Dre, DOC, and Michelle Lay's contracts from Ruthless Records through allegedly illicit means, with some saying that Suge Knight threatened Easy and Jerry with physical violence, as well as threatening Easy es mother. Many have noted that it was threats to Easy es mother in particular that got them to sign the deal. In 1992, Death Row Records would be co-founded by Dr. Dre, D.O.C., Suge Knight, and music exec Dick Griffey. With the new establishment of Death Row Records, Suge would help bring the West Coast gangster rap of Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and Tupac Shakur to the mainstream, pushing aside the pop rap of artists such as MC Hammer and Tone Lock, and putting low riders and gang signs into heavy rotation on MTV. In the 
process, Suge Knight established himself as a legendary music biz tough guy. Dr. Dre's The Chronic in 1992 and Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style in 1993 were Death Row's first two album releases, and they were met with critical and commercial acclaim, effectively taking Suge and Death Row records to the very top. Even with the level of sustained success at the time, the big problem was that cracks started to show in his relationship with Dr. Dre. Whatever their contracts were, Dre felt like he was ready to break off onto his own. And without the golden touch and mind of Dre, as well as Tupac Shakur getting killed, the whole empire just starts to crumble and fall like a house of cards. Since then, it's been a steady stream of problems for Shug. Gang Gang by Moneybag Yo. In 2016, a collab mixtape by Moneybag Yo and Yo Gotti was released, and the 10th track titled Gang Gang had a reference to the Suge Knight. The lyrics go as such, rep the same gang, gang bang, I'm tougher than Suge Knight, gang bang. As a mammoth 315 pound man, Suge Knight was a gangster with a substantial criminal record, replete with violent acts. Suge typified what it meant to be a gangster. I mean, why would someone who was a central figure in pushing gangster rap to the world not be an original gangster? Suge was affiliated with the Bloods Gang, a primarily African-American street gang founded in Los Angeles, California. The gang is prominent for its heated rivalry with the Crips. The Bloods comprise various subgroups known as sets, among which significant differences exist, such as colors, clothing, operations, and political ideas that may be in open conflict with each other. These sets are often loosely connected, having their own leader and operating independently from one another. These sets include Black Peace Stone's Jungles, Bounty Hunter Watts Blood, Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods, United Blood Nation and Pyrus. The Pyrus are further divided into Mob Pyru, Fruit Town Pyru, Elm Street Pyru, Treetop Pyru, and Cedar Block Pyru. Suge Knight, who was affiliated with the Mob Pyru Bloods, hired members from this gang to work for Death Row Records. He also hired members of two other blood sets, Fruit Town Pyru and Looters Park Pyru. By the early 2000s, a rivalry developed between the Mob Peru and the Fruit Town Peru, resulting in several people's deaths from Knight's inner circle. Despite multiple sets within the Bloods gang, they are all identified by the red color worn by its members and by particular gang symbols, including distinctive hand signs. Suge Knight's office in Los Angeles was distinctly decorated in red, the color of the bloods. He opened a private, by appointment only nightclub in Las Vegas called Club 662, so named because the numbers spelled out mob on telephone keypads, mob standing for member of blood. So it was safe to say Suge Knight took the gangster life pretty seriously, even for the rough edge music industry, which over time has been prone to excess and to connections with criminal affairs, Death Row was a remarkable place. It was nothing for Knight to hand over a stack of $100 bills to Tupac Shakur for a weekend's expenses. A longtime veteran of the Los Angeles music business who worked with Tupac Shakur commented saying, I have not been to one other studio to this day where you have to be searched before you get in. They have a checklist of people who can go in with guns. So you have to figure, these guys have guns and it's a long run to the front door and there's security at the front door that may try to stop you, even if you get there. Some of the security guys were gangsters just just out of the penitentiary. They would look at you, staring right through you. No words would have to be said. Intimidation was Suge Knight's bread and butter. It is alleged that he forced a black music executive at a rival company to strip in the men's room and then made him walk naked through his company's offices. Even when he was on his supposed best behavior, such as when dealing with a white executive at one of the major entertainment companies, danger seemingly still hung heavy in the air. There was a negotiation he had in the apparent safety of his own office. For quite some time, the aura of violence helped helped Suge Knight well. It granted him enormous license in small things, such as keeping executives waiting for hours, with the execs offering no words of objection whatsoever. Certain music and video producers who claimed that Death Row owed them money were too scared to demand it or even take legal action. The potential for violence was also a powerful disincentive to anyone who might have considered talking to law enforcement authorities about questionable practices. In true gangster fashion, Suge Knight had multiple encounters with the law and also a ton of legal problems. In a 1995 federal case, Suge Knight pleaded no contest and was sentenced to five years probation for assaulting two rappers at a recording studio in the summer of 1992. On October 22nd, 1996, Suge Knight was sent to jail pending a hearing on the probation violation that happened on September 7th, 1996, when Suge Knight and his death row entourage, including Tupac Shakur, attacked Orlando Anderson, a rival Crips gang member. Suge was then sentenced to nine years in prison on February 28, 1997 for the probation violation violation, but was granted early release on August 6, 2001. Two years after being released, Suge Knight was sent to the slammer again for violating parole when he struck a parking lot attendant. In January 2008, it was revealed by police that Suge Knight was one of the members of the Mob Peru street gang in a crackdown by authorities in the city of
of Compton. That same year, on October 30th, Knight filed a lawsuit against Kanye West and his associates. The lawsuit concerns an August 2005 shooting at West's pre-video music awards party in Miami, where Suge was wounded by a gunshot to the upper leg. A police report of the incident described the man who allegedly shot Suge Knight at the Shore Club in Miami Beach as black and wearing a pink shirt. However, a spokesperson for the Miami Beach Police at the time could make no breakthrough in the case, telling the Miami Herald that the investigation was being hampered by witnesses' unwillingness to talk. We don't have any physical description. We don't know how many subjects were involved, which is mind-boggling with all those people around. In 2012, Suge was arrested in Las Vegas after police found cannabis in his car and several warrants for prior traffic violations. On August 24, 2014, Suge came very close to death. He was shot at a pre-video music awards party hosted by Chris Brown at a West Hollywood Sunset Strip nightclub. Even after being shot six times, he was still able to walk from the venue to an ambulance. Evidence from CCTV footage showed that Suge was the intended target of the shooting. My by The Game. In 2007, The Game released an unofficial album titled Ain't No Game, The Real Story. This track was a diss track aimed at 50 Cent Jay-Z and Suge Knight while biting lines from Bitches Ain't Shit by Dr. Dre. In the third verse of the track, The Game goes all in on Suge. The lyrics go as follows. Bitch tried to burn Snoop Stole Chronic from Doc Blue the whole West Coast, even tried to pack type of bitch to stand on Beverly Hills word on the street, she got a few real n****s killed. Now it's been said that Suge Knight, aka the John Gotti of gangster rap, played a central and pivotal role in the deaths of the two most widely acclaimed MCs of all time, Tupac Shakur and Biggie Small. Every brother in here, please take your hat off. At 7.03 p.m. New York time, 4.03, it's been 25 years since the murder of Notorious B.I.G. and a drive-by shooting on an L.A. street rocked the music industry to its core. A quarter of a century later, the slaying remains officially unsolved, a case steeped in conspiracy theories and alleged cover-up. Now back in 1995, Suge Knight, CEO of Death Row Records, arranged for the posting of his $1.4 million bond for Tupac Shakur. He had begun serving a prison sentence of up to four and a half years on sexual abuse charges at Rikers Island. Tupac Shakur has been sentenced to a maximum of four and a half years in prison for sexually abusing a fan. After being released, he became the latest signee to commercial juggernaut, Death Row Records. And just a year later, the label released Shakur's greatest commercial success, All Eyes On Me. This album broke new bounds and shattered records. It was influential as being rap's first double album, meeting two of the three albums due in Shakur's contract with Death Row Records. The album highlights Tupac Shakur rapping about the gangster lifestyle, leaving behind his previous political messages. In September of that same year, Tupac's life would meet an unprecedented end, with a lot of rumors circulating that Suge Knight had a hand in it. Suge Knight, who was released from the hospital Sunday night, spoke with police and told them he, quote, heard something but saw nothing. On the 7th of September, 1996, Tupac Shakur attended the Mike Tyson versus Bruce Selvin boxing match with Suge Knight at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. After leaving the venue, one of Knight's associates, Lane, a member of the MLB gang based in Compton, California, spotted a member of the rival Southside Compton Crips gang called Orlando Anderson. Now, this altercation did not just start from here. It had been building up for quite some time. A few months prior, Orlando Anderson and a group of Southside Crips tried to rob Lane at a mall in Lake Lakewood, California. Lane told Tupac Shakur of the previous incident, who decided to attack Anderson in the lobby and punched him in the face, knocking him to the ground. Tupac Shakur and Suge Knight's entourage also got in the mix and assisted in beating up Anderson, with the fight being captured on the MGM Grand's video surveillance. After the altercation, Tupac Shakur returned to his hotel, the Luxor Las Vegas, and eventually departed with Suge Knight in a black BMW 750 IL sedan. At about 11.15 p.m., a white, four-door, late-model Cadillac pulled up to Suge Knight's right side. The shooter, seated at the back of the Cadillac, rolled down the window and immediately fired gunshots at Tupac Shakur's BMW. Tupac was hit four times in total, twice in the chest, once in the arm, and once in the bullets also went straight into Shakur's right lung. This was deemed very fatal, and he passed just six days later on September 13th. Tupac Shakur has died six days after he was wounded in a drive-by shooting. Fans had held a vigil outside his Las Vegas hospital. After his death, certain individuals started to suspect foul play from Suge Knight. Former death row artists such as Snoop Dogg later accused Suge Knight of being a part of Tupac's murder. Former detective Russell Poole also had a theory that Suge Knight killed Tupac before he could part ways with Knight's label. 
label. With Suge being notorious for having strained relationships with his label artists, this theory might have some basis, but it's still just a theory. The theory also goes deeper. It's said that after Tupac's death, Suge conspired to kill Biggie to divert attention from himself in the Tupac case. Six months after Tupac died, 24-year-old Christopher Wallace, popularly known as Notorious Big, was assassinated in a drive-by shooting in the early hours of March 9, 1997, in Los Angeles, California. In the early hours of March 9th, Biggie Smalls left a party with his entourage in two Chevrolet Suburbans to attend an after-party in the Hollywood Hills. Prior to leaving, the Los Angeles Fire Department closed the party early because of smoking, loud music, and overcrowding. Biggie was in the front passenger seat in one vehicle, while Sean Combs, aka Puff Daddy, traveled in the other vehicle. The two SUVs were shadowed by a Chevrolet Blazer carrying Bad Boy Records Director of Security, Paul offered. Biggie Small's SUV stopped at a red light on the corner, and two minutes later, a dark-colored Chevrolet Impala SS pulled up alongside Biggie. The driver of the Impala rolled down his window, drew a 9mm blue steel pistol, and fired at the vehicle. Just like Tupac, four bullets reportedly hit Biggie. He was immediately rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where doctors performed an emergency thoracotomy, but he was pronounced dead at 1.15 a.m. Rapper Chris Wallace, better known as Notorious B.I.G., was gunned down in a drive-by shooting at 12.04 a.m. Pacific time Sunday morning. Biggie was rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. Prison death row chief Suge Knight was shocked and saddened, and that having recently lost Tupac Shakur to the same senseless violence, they could sympathize. Immediately after the shooting, conspiracy theorists were out in full force. People started to connect Biggie's murder with that of Tupac six months earlier. Due to the similarity in the drive-by shootings and the highly publicized East Coast and West Coast hip-hop rivalry, of which Tupac and Biggie had been key and central figures. Details of this case play out like a Hollywood movie. Rapper Tupac Shakur is gunned down in September of 1996. Six months later, rapper Notorious B.I.G. is shot to death in Los Angeles. Both Biggie and Tupac gunned down in their prime within months of each other. It may involve a long rumored rap feud said to be going on between Death Row Records and Bad Boy Entertainment. The name that was in everyone's mouth concerning the murders was Suge Knight. In a 2002 book by American journalist Randall Sullivan titled Labyrinth. Key information and stories were put together about the murders of Biggie and Tupac based on information provided by retired LAPD detective Russell Poole. In the book, Sullivan accused Suge Knight, a known Bloods affiliate, of conspiring with corrupt Los Angeles Police Department officer David Mack to kill Biggie and make both deaths appear to be the result of the rap rivalry. This murder theory implicated a lot of personalities, including Suge Knight, a rogue cop, and a mortgage broker named Amir Muhammad, along with the chief of police in a conspiracy to murder and cover up the murder of Biggie. This theory formed the basis of a 500 million US dollars lawsuit by his family, the Wallaces, against the city of Los Angeles. A crucial source for this theory was Kevin Hackey. Hackey was a former death row associate, and he had implicated Suge Knight and LAPD officer David Mack. Hackey said that he had knowledge of involvement between Knight and Mack and other LAPD officers. His information was used by the family of Biggie Smalls in their suit against the city of LA for Biggie's death. The suit brought by the Wallace family against the city of LA based on the Russell Poole theory was eventually dismissed. In 2005, Chuck Phillips of the Los Angeles Times reported that another source for the theory of Biggie's murder implicating Muhammad, Mack, Suge Knight, and the LAPD was a schizophrenic man known as Psycho Mike who later confessed to hearsay and memory lapses and falsely identifying Muhammad. That's him right there. That's him. Yeah. That's him. That's the guy that came up to me. Despite all the theories and stories in hip-hop lore about Suge conspiring to murder both Tupac and Biggie, there is still no definitive evidence that he did it. I'm Not Going by Gucci Mane. For his 13th studio album, Evil Genius, Gucci Mane teamed up with Louisiana rapper Kevin Gates to release the first promotional single off the album titled, I'm Not Going on November 15, 2018. In the chorus, Gucci Mane references Suge Knight being sentenced to 28 years in prison just two months prior to the release of the track. Here's how it goes. I'm getting too rich to fly commercial flights. They want to lock me up like Suge Knight. With Suge having numerous spells in prison in the past, he is currently serving his longest term yet. In September of 2018, Suge Knight pleaded no contest to voluntary manslaughter, with the judge sentencing Knight to 28 years in prison, 22 years for running over the victim, and six years because it was his third strike under 
under California's three strikes law. The big incident that would see Suge Knight get locked up for 28 years happened on January 29, 2015. On this fateful day, witnesses claimed they saw Suge Knight and one of his longtime rivals, CLE Sloan, AKA The Bone, fighting outside a Compton burger stand. Knight was furious about his portrayal in an NWA commercially successful biopic, Straight Outta Compton, on which Sloan was serving as a consultant. Knight trailed him to the burger stand parking lot and intentionally clipped Sloan with his pickup truck, seriously injuring him before speeding through the parking lot and running over Terry Carter, his friend and co-founder of Heavyweight Records. He immediately fled the scene in Compton, California. Terry Carter unfortunately died, while the second victim, CLE Sloan, suffered multiple fractures in his ankles, as well as sustaining head injuries. Security footage showed Suge Knight running over both men. Meanwhile, Knight claimed he acted in self-defense. Two months later after the incident, Suge Knight was hospitalized after he told a judge that he was suffering from blindness and other complications. Throughout the trial, Suge Knight fired multiple attorneys and said he was receiving inadequate medical treatment while in custody. Knight also happened to shuffle his defense team about 16 times throughout the entire trial. In July 2016, the judge denied Knight's motion to reveal the identities of several key prosecution witnesses, citing Knight's long history of violence. But it was not only violence Suge Knight had in store for the witnesses, he also wanted to pay them off. Six months before Knight's plea deal, his attorney, Matthew Fletcher, and another member of Knight's defense team, Thaddeus Culpepper, were indicted on several charges related to the alleged witness tampering. Two attorneys for former rap mogul Suge Knight have been arrested. A spokeswoman for the Sheriff's Department says lawyers for Matthew Fletcher and Thaddeus Culpepper have been charged with being accessories after the fact to a felony. Prosecutors cited that the attorneys of rap mogul Suge Knight were prepared to pay witnesses to testify that a group of men who confronted Knight at the burger stand were armed with guns in order to bolster Knight's claim he was the target of an assassination plot and had been fleeing for his life when he killed Terry Carter and seriously injured CLE Bone Sloan in January of 2015. The 28-year sentence Suge Knight received is a whole lot more than the amount Gucci Mane himself had received. Guwap has had his fair share of legal issues and prison stints. Before getting sentenced in 2014, he already had a long history with the law, starting all the way back in 2001. In April 2001, 21-year-old Gucci Mane was arrested on cocaine charges and sentenced to 90 days in county jail. On May 10, 2005, Guwap was attacked by a group of men in Georgia. He and his companions shot at the group, killing one. Guwap turned himself into police investigators nine days later and was subsequently charged with murder. He insisted that the shots fired by him and his crew were in self-defense. The murder charge eventually got dropped in January 2006 due to insufficient evidence. In the same vein, Guwap had pleaded no contest to a charge of aggravated assault for assaulting a nightclub promoter the previous June. At the time, the murder charge was dropped and he would end up serving a six-month county jail sentence for this. Now, on the 13th of September, 2013, Gucci Mane was chilling with a friend and he started behaving erratically. The friend called the police to help him out and when they arrived, Gucci Mane began cursing and threatening them. Authorities took him into custody and found marijuana and a handgun on him. He was booked on charges of carrying a concealed weapon, possession of marijuana, and disorderly conduct. Two weeks later, it was revealed that Gucci Mane would serve 183 days in jail on charges of firearm possession by a convicted felon, disorderly conduct, carrying a concealed weapon, and marijuana possession, among others. On December 3rd, 2013, Gucci Mane was charged in federal court with two counts of possessing a firearm as a felon. According to the federal prosecutor, Gucci Mane was in possession of two different loaded guns between September 12th and 14, 2013, and could be sentenced to up to 20 years in prison. U.S. District Judge Steve C. Jones told Davis he's heard from his nieces and nephews that the rapper is a talented musician with a potentially bright future and warned him not to squander that. You're still a young man and you can still do a lot if you follow and abide by the law. His lawyers informed the judge that he has been struggling with addiction to a mixture of cough syrup and soda, known as lean, and asked that the judge recommend that he be sent to a facility with a recovery program. Lawyer Drew Finling said Guwap would prefer to serve his time on the West Coast to be away from distractions closer to home. On May 13, 2014, Gucci Mane pleaded guilty to possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. He agreed to a plea deal that would result in him being in prison until late 2016. He served his sentence in the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana. On May 26, 2016,
Mane was released from prison ahead of his scheduled September date. This was due to Gucci Mane not initially being credited for the time he served while waiting for his court date, Ugh, by Drakeo the Ruler. In the 2016 album by Drakeo the Ruler titled I Am Mosley 2, a track called Ugh featured a call out to Suge Knight. On the chorus of the track, the following lines are heard. That chopper make him go Ugh, I'm a bully breaker. Who the f he think he Suge? The line refers to Suge Knight being a big bad bully in the rap scene. A lot of his antics and activities have been etched into rap lore and having people dangled by their ankles off of the balcony of a hotel many floors up. A widely known victim of his bullying antics is none other than Vanilla Ice. Robert Matthew Van Winkle, known professionally as Vanilla Ice, became the first rapper to ever hit number one on the Billboard charts and has been credited with helping to diversify hip hop by introducing it to a mainstream audience. But he didn't start out dropping punchline. Vanilla Ice started out as a breakdancer in Dallas and Miami around the age of 14, and that was when he was first given the nickname Vanilla because he was the only white one on the crew. When he was a teenager, Vanilla Ice started battle rapping at parties, and everyone was calling him MC Vanilla. He then joined a new breakdancing crew, and his stage name became Vanilla Ice. According to Vanilla Ice, he wrote the track Ice Ice Baby when he was just 16, but back then, he was more focused on racing motocross than making it in the music industry. He was a talented racer, and he went on to win three championship, but everything changed when he crashed during a race and broke his ankle in 1985. After the accident, Vanilla Ice was not interested in racing professionally for some time, and he used his spare time to perfect his dance moves, beatboxing, and writing of rhymes. One night, he went to a nightclub in South Dallas called City Lights, and his friend Squirrel dared him to go on stage for the open mic. Ice agreed, and the crowd loved him straight away. He was so popular that the club manager asked him to come back all the time. Ice would end up opening up for legendary artists like N.W.A. The owner of the club, Tommy Kwan, decided to sign him to his management company and started paying for Ice's studio time. Ice had been writing and performing tracks at the club, but didn't have anything officially recorded yet. The first single they put out was a cover of Play That Funky Music with Ice Ice Baby on the B side. Kwan tried pushing Play That Funky Music to radio stations all over the country, even personally sending out the single to various radio stations around the U.S. But nobody was really vibing to the track. Most DJ DJs didn't want to play it, and the ones who did play it didn't really like it. But everything changed when a DJ from Georgia played the B-side Ice Ice Baby instead of the main single. When Ice Ice Baby played for the first time, it was an instant hit, and it sparked a huge wave of other stations playing the track. It became viral and blew up at a rapid pace. Tommy Kwan took advantage of this wave and coughed out $8,000 to do a video for the track which made it blow up even more. Overnight, Vanilla Ice had gone from a club performer in Texas to one of the hottest new artists in the world. He started spending time in LA, working on new deals and celebrating the success. But that's when his fortunes took another course. He ran into the big bad wolf, Suge Knight, and everything changed. Following the success of Ice Ice Baby, record producer Suge Knight and two bodyguards arrived at the Palm Restaurant in West Hollywood, where Vanilla Ice was having a meal. In an interview with ABC News, Vanilla Ice recalled, it was very intimidating to see these guys they were bigger than my bodyguards, you know, and a bunch of them, and they pretty much grabbed my bodyguard and pulled him out and sat down next to me right there and started talking to me, totally uninvited. After shoving Ice's bodyguards aside, Suge and his own bodyguards sat down in front of Ice, staring at him before finally asking, how you doing? Similar incidents were repeated on several occasions where Suge Knight would appear uninvited to a place Vanilla Ice is, say hi, and just leave without any explanation. Eventually, Suge showed up at Ice's hotel suite on the 15th floor of the Beverly Hills Hotel, accompanied by a member of the Los Angeles Raiders football team and six men. According to Ice, Suge and his entourage roughed up his bodyguards and took him out on the balcony by himself. When they got there, Suge started talking to him. He then took him over to the edge and had him look over the edge to show him how high up he was. At the time, Suge was managing a guy named Mario Laval Johnson. According to Suge, Johnson is the one who wrote the track, but Ice never paid them what they were balcony, Vanilla Ice says Suge Knight told him to sign over points on the song to Mario Johnson and implied that he would throw him off the balcony unless he signed the publishing rights to the song. In his interview with ABC, Ice said he was very scared during the situation. However, in an interview with ABC News, Suge Knight denied he ever threatened or implied to throw Vanilla Ice off the balcony saying it was all business, but everyone knows just how brutal he was back then. The only reason Suge was able to sign Dr. Dre too. Death Row was that he threatened Eazy-E and Jerry Heller 
with baseball bats and told them he will take out their families, and as death row blew up, so did his brutality and violence. Two years after he almost made Vanilla Ice shit his pants on that balcony, Suge pistol whipped two rappers who used the phone at death row records without asking him. There are lots of stories where Suge would take employees into locked rooms and beat them up. Other employees would have to keep working while hearing their co-workers shouting for help in the next room. Bullying, harassment, threats, violence, intimidation. This was the full Suge Knight package. If you enjoyed this video, check out our other awesome videos on the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.